Yeah, so for anyone tuning in, this book. Oh, oh well, it jumps with, a, in. with a virtual background, it doesn't work. It so won't well. work. So, no. Let me uh, let me get. What's interesting it. though, maybe you could just move that around a little bit. <laughs> it's like <laughs> flashing in and out. It's like. It's a yeah. There book. you go. Yeah. Uh, well, geez. Oh. But yeah, I haven't used this too much, so I'm not really sure what I'm doing. Yeah, this okay. So this book here, folks, it's really cool. Um, you, you know what? I, I love that the body. Uh, uh, COVID brain, it's really bad today. The beat, body, brain. Each beat, body, and brain are taking up a page, very succinctly written, and uh, enough to get you thinking about each one and then integrating. I love that. It's really great. You have some really nice, uh, I almost look at like a, a tribute to so many players who have uh, you in the beginning where you have this. Yeah, This is really cool. And it's, and it's a list of pages. guys to check out, you know, from, of guys in that style that were influential in being able to listen and play to that music. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, it's great, man. I haven't gone through rhythms yet because I haven't been able to focus very well. Somebody named Kevin Goodman says hello. Hey. Hello, Kevin. Um, yeah, it's it's cool, man. I love it. I love it. And I didn't put in the CD yet because my new computer doesn't have a CD player, but I'm figuring out how to deal oh. with that. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, they're really cheap and they work as a USB plug-in. Oh, cool. Yeah, if you get one. I mean, school gave me one. I think it was 30 bucks, but it works great. Oh, that's cool. You know, I'm technologically a little bit behind. So, uh, yeah. So, I, I was going through this. There's a bunch of stuff that I didn't. Oh, and thanks for signing it for me, too. That's really nice. <laughs> step by step. Yeah. There's a, <laughs> there's a lot in here that is... Um, that I was not aware of as far as recordings that a lot of my favorite favorite players have played on. So now I have places to go and check things out, and get some new sounds, you know, ear candy. Yeah. And I, but I didn't make up there. I could, should probably go through and make up a URL list. It goes mm -hmm. along with all those recordings. Like, the, you know, like that stuff I sent you about that I was saying about Peter would have a whole URL list that would link the music up with those transcriptions. Yes. Yes. And, that, and yeah. that's uh, like that class, that class went for fusion styles because it was a jazz rock funk fusion world. And we do one guy each week for 15 weeks. So it would be, it wasn't about playing, it was about listening. Mm. So you could find out about each of those guys that are on the, on yeah. the list and figure out which ones were accessible to you about or inspirational to you for developing uh, those grooves but yeah that's cool you know i saw this here omar hakim with weather report in yeah, probably 83 um i remember they played d flat waltz that night that was yeah. cool yeah that's what a band so victor bailey was in that band he he was a berkeley guy wasn't he didn't he teach there he taught, yeah. And he also you, taught there. You must have known Victor. No, I didn't. Oh, I never, okay. I never even saw him, and he was one floor up from me. Oh, but he wow. was there later on, and then I think he was was transitioning because he was in a wheelchair towards the end. Oh yeah, yeah. That's so sad. I, what, what happened? What he had a, a hereditary disease that uh, was a, like a muscular degeneration kind of thing. And his father, his uncle, or something, it was something he knew about from the beginning. Okay. But I mean, he had a, a lot of courage and a lot of strength, and he just he just literally played it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was talking with another person who teaches at uh, um, Berkeley, Steve Hunt. Because mm -hmm. there's a tune. I don't remember. It's on Steve's brand new album that came out a couple weeks ago that the original version of that tune or maybe the inspiration for the bass line was something that Victor did mm -hmm. and as Vic, as only Victor could do. So Steve and I were talking about that. It's pretty interesting. Uh, and I saw, I only saw him one other time. It was with, 
weather update the mm -hmm. where Steve Kahn replaced Wayne Shorter. <laughs> yeah, okay. And Peter played the Yamaha electric kit most mm -hmm. of the night. Yeah. Yeah, that's the blue with the red letter cover, I think. Mm hmm Yeah, it is. Mm hmm So what's happening over there in uh the class has started, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're doing some teaching? Yes, yeah. Online on Mondays and live on Thursdays for private lessons. So you have to go in and get tested, that kind of thing. And then you're in a room that you move every half hour, regardless of the length of the lesson. Oh, good. But my office is the biggest one in the department. So mm -hmm. I kind of like hang out in there because I can be 20 feet from the guy. Yeah, that's and good. Everybody yeah. has, man. It's, it's good. And there's two drum sets in there now that I don't have mine in there, but I share the office with Alberto Neto. Oh, great. I know the name. I'm trying to place that place where I've maybe heard him. You have a visitor behind you somewhere. Mm, that's the dog. That's Max. Maximilian. That's great. He's hanging out with me today. Gwen's in her office and Natalie's in her room when we're all at one end of the house. Okay. So we have to keep it. And if I leave him out, every person that walks by or every coyote or yeah. mailman or, or delivery guy, then he goes nuts and disrupts her. Because <laughs> yeah. she's online with her client stuff. Okay. We've, we've had a management consulting company since 1985. Uh -huh. And so. What type of. Uh, it's what type management of consulting? consulting, mostly. Um, change management and diversity. Mm -hmm. And it went from scientific organizations like um, Stratus Computers and uh, what's the people that made, um, oh, I forget the name of the big company. They made the rocket fuel for the, the uh, satellite launches. I forget mm -hmm. the name, but it, wow. it, she would travel around and other ones, she would go to Europe you know, do seminars and stuff, kind of like your stuff, but it was about change management and mm -hmm. like oh, the ones, the com companies that from the United States that bought foreign companies, then she would have to go bring the foreign companies in line with what they had to do because uh, of the laws in America. Okay. Interesting. Wow. And she has um, a background in legal services. She ran that for Bo the city of Boston. And oh, great. Yeah, so it's done very well over the years. That's why I, I can live up here in the, in the North Shore. And if Rich was here, he, he came up here, uh, Farago, he came, um, he, so he knows what we're talking about. Last mm -hmm. time, remember, he said, oh, yeah, I remember that. So mm -hmm. we can be up here. That's great. Hey, completely different subject. Your, okay, uh, left turn. Your uh, ride symbol over there, is that a flat top? That's a um, 602 Peisty. It's an 18. 18 and I'm yeah. trying that so it don't it doesn't blow out the uh, sound so much and listen and doing the lessons. Oh yeah. So is that a flat top? It's a flat. It's a flat ride. Flat ride. That's what I mean. The, pardon and, me. And it's this COVID brain is still huh? a thing. <laughs> so it, it's um. It's from 68, around the time of the first flat rides that Roy recorded with Chick Corea. Now he yeah. sings and now he sounds. Yeah. And we had that symbol from that recording on a stand next to this one. And that was even higher than mine. Mm. Damun Hamau and I hung out one night and we tried these symbols because we weren't playing, but Ayerto was playing with Chick Corea at the beginning of the 70s in the acoustic, yeah. acoustic return to forever with mm -hmm. Flora. Right. And at the end of the night, we went up and tried this, the symbols and stuff. And I guess maybe Roy had given it to Chick and then Chick let Ayerto play it for those recordings and the uh, gigs. Oh, wow. Yeah, you know, when you listen to, uh, what is it? Maybe Light as a Feather or... No, this would be... Well, you mean from the acoustic that. one? Yeah, because yeah, that's they're... Even before, what's they're the original, yeah, I'm sorry. What's the original acoustic Return to Forever? Uh, That's Flora, Erto, Flora. Uh, who's on, who's I on bass? I think it's Stanley Clark. Okay. Yeah. So there's a flat. So Erto's using a flat top on that. Huh? 
or flat right? It was on the live gigs. I don't know if I don't remember on the recordings. Hmm. They were done for ECM, and then they did a, a, I think a year or so of support for that music, but that was all. She played percussion and sang, and he played drums when I oh. saw him do that. Yeah, so she can play. Interesting. Yeah, I, I never saw her. I saw him one time. I saw him with the, the super band. Randy Brecker, Steve Smith, Stanley Clark, and Alan Holdsworth, and Eric. Okay, and maybe, doing percussion, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, percussion. I, maybe there was keys. Jim Beard, possibly. I'm not sure. Mm. I think it might have been Jim Beard. I'm not sure. But in that acoustic uh, Return to Forever, he was playing drums. Yeah, yeah, totally. In fact, I used to take drum lessons from a guy. I don't know if you know Danny D'Imperio. Yeah. So Danny played you know, back in the 60s, I guess, maybe with Woody. And then I saw him in the early or mid 70s with Maynard before, mm -hmm. before Peter's time. Yeah, but he, he did guy, a lot yeah. of, he's also a really good bass player. Danny wow. is a really great upright player. So during the lessons, it was cool. It's like an hour from me, if that, in Cortland, south of Syracuse. I drive down and uh, why am I telling you this? Oh yeah, I know. Because he would play bass while I played drums and it was beautiful because he has really good time and feel internally, of course, and his mm -hmm. uh, bass playing was phenomenal. It was a really good lesson in how to work with a bass player. And then uh, he wrote out some stuff for me in between cocktails. And um, we had uh, the Erto, I think he entitled, I still have it downstairs, the Erto Samba or something like that. You know, it's basically, you know, on the ride and the 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 kick is going do 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 do, and um, some of that came from, well, Erto, but that first first acoustic Return to Forever album. At least one song on there. I just right now I can't remember, but that was cool, you know. And he had some nice light symbols that he used. Um, and I love now he sings now he sobs one of my favorites. I love that. Right. And when that came out, there was no listing of who the bass player or drummer were. But I I know and I knew it was well. I knew it was Roy, but I didn't know who the bass player was. And that was early on in Miroslav's career. But he had been playing well, he went to school at Berkeley for like a semester or something. And then he went to New York and he was on um and on a recording with Herbie Mann. And Bruno Carr was playing drums, and it's burning. It's really good. Um, and that was the first time that I had heard him playing. And then, not too long after that, he was on the uh, Chick Korea Now He Sings, Now He Sobs. Okay, so that's, now, that's and 60s, now he, right? The late 60s? 68, yeah. And then, so, okay, so that was before Weather Report for him. Before, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a few years. Did you ever work with Miroslav? Yeah. I did the recording with him, and then they took him off that recording. <laughs> and they, re they replaced him with another friend of mine, um, um, Slim Johnson. Okay, I've heard the name. Yeah, he's on. Yeah, he did the one, the next one too. He did um, the one with. Um, I'm having a brain problem. It's catching. Um, Don't get COVID. With and uh, with um, and Dugu. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a guy. Alfon Alfonso Johnson. Sorry. Oh but yeah. He, to me, he was known as Slim. I, I knew him from playing at that club, and he was working with Chuck Mangione. Oh, I didn't know he did the Mangione gig. Yeah, and Joe LaBarber was the drummer. I know him from that too. And there's actually a recording with those guys that I can't find. And uh, Joe LaBarba plays this great solo on a tune called Between Races. And it was just dynamite, up-tempo, like swing thing. You know, um, Joe is like an unsung hero, I think, in some ways. Because he's just, uh, I saw him with Woody mm -hmm. way back as a kid. And then uh, he he was a Bill Evans. You know, did the Tony Bennett gig. I mean, he's doing a lot of stuff. There, There's a recording and I'm a kind of a little bit uh, ADD here. I'm thinking that La, La Barbara brothers are from Rochester, and so are mm -hmm. the Manjone family. So 
Right. They knew each other. Right. But then uh, Pat LaBarbera and Joe mm -hmm. did an album together in the 70s. I don't, I think it might be called Pass It On. <laughs> and it is, it, this is kind of like Elvin and Train. It, oh, you can okay. tell the influences there and the, the, everything is just so beautiful. Yeah, I'll check I, that out. I have it on uh, vinyl in the basement. And when I, when we get done, I can go check it out. It's a beautiful recording. I should try to digitize that and uh, listen, or maybe I'll find it online. I don't know. Yeah, it, we look online first because there's so many things. As mm -hmm. as esoteric as it may sound, it might be there. Yeah, it could be. That's why I like that those lists of all those tunes and everything. Instead of in the class, I would put those for the students. But now I and now I, if I wasn't in the class, I can't give it to them. Yeah. Unless I actually give them the music as an MP3 or something. So I, now I can give them the uh, link, the URL to it, and they can listen to it whenever they want without yeah. anything from me, really. And, and please refresh my memory. What classes right now at Berkeley are you teaching? The survey classes. Um, it's the uh, drum styles to the 60s, which is a performance requirement at school because it's the history of jazz from 1880s through the 60s. Oh, wow. And then there's another one, it's called Drum Styles Post 60s, and that's from 1960 to now, but it's not about just about jazz. It's about jazz, rock, funk, fusion, and world. Oh, that sounds pretty cool. So by the way, by, um, by decade. By, by the way, a couple of my friends are watching uh, Stuart Heinrich. Hey, Stu, I still owe you. <laughs> From three, the long story on that, Stu, I, I promise, I, I got, I tested again, positive for COVID. It came back today, positive. I got three negative tests in a row and I'm fine when I sit down and talk. And Peter Erskine's here too. Hey, Pete, what's up, man? I'm the lead in. Maybe we should do some of your tunes, Peter. Yeah. Peter says, hey, Skip and Carl. <laughs> do the well, transcriptions and play some of the music. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to talk with Peter at one o'clock today, Eastern time. Um, I'm looking forward to that too. And it's, it's funny, like you get up and I move around and start to get dizzy and woozy and uh, that the headaches have, I never get headaches in my life. I might've had five and now they're every day. I'm not complaining. There's so many people way worse off than I am health wise. I'm just glad it didn't cause blood clots for me and i'm glad my respiratory is okay because i have a long history of respiratory problems mm. probably related to not smoking but playing in smoky bars right Stu? we did a lot of that shit uh, for 25 however years you know it's like breathe i remember coming home i'm sure we've all done it right you take a shower your, your car and your drums and everything smells like smoke and the cases and you come home and your clothes are smoked your hair is i had hair at one point and even in the morning after a shower at night. Uh, yeah, Peter is cold. Well, it's, it's, not t it's above freezing today. We only have about 14 inches of snow on the ground here. Oh, oh, it looks cold where you are, Skip. Is it cold there, Skip? Yeah, but it's only low 30s. Yeah. But I'm in the northwest corner of the house, so any breeze makes it like... I live in an old center door colonial with uh, no insulation. So... Um, I have the heater on. Peter says, shower after the gig of must. Yeah, I, I mean, even now, well, I don't play live gigs lately, but yeah. But man, I get up in the morning and still have like smoky smelling hair. So I don't know. That just comes back around to this uh, ADHD tangent that I tend to go on about COVID. And I'm very lucky. All I'm going to say is I'm going to play it out. You know, I'll just get through it. It's what you have to do, right? So, mm -hmm. but it's weird. I got to tell you. So, um, we're oh, so Ndugu. I, I think I know Peter knew him. I think maybe didn't he teach at USC also? Yeah. Um, yeah, and he passed away. I don't know three four years ago. I never saw him. What was it like uh, being around him? I hear he was a really cool guy. You ask a great Peter, player, of course. Oh, yeah. no, I'm asking you. Oh, no, because I, I knew him because of the relationship with Yamaha. We did okay. a uh, we did a shoot one day. It was with uh, 
I think Roy Haynes and him and me and somebody else. And they had, then when the thing came out, it had Roy like kind of in the center of this graphic. And then I was like flying over Roy with another drum set. And then Dugo was on that same page. And we were all from that same shoot. Oh, so, wow. And that was, ooh, beginning of this century. And then I knew him because we would uh, – communicate with emails and also at PAS, like oh, then we would right. hang out the whole five days and go to all the meetings and- I always yeah. forget about PAS. And he, he did was... several presentations there that were, you know, dynamite because he could play Latin percussion and drum set and mix it all up, you know, he was- Yeah. And, and great energy all the time. Yeah. By the way, Peter says, Skip. Mm. Your fleece sweater reminds me of being indoors in Japan during the winter. No central heating in the older homes there. Right. <laughs> exactly. This is a Patagonia? Uh, no, sorry. I, ha I haven't <laughs> been to Japan yet. I've been to many countries, but not there. Yeah. I really want to get there, though, at some point. Yes, and Dugu taught at USC for many years, the third anniversary of his death mm -hmm. days ago. Whoa, I knew it was fairly recent sort mm -hmm. of uh and we are dedicating the teaching studio he used uh, used in his memory will kennedy teaches there oh great when the lockdown is not happening anyways there'll be a fitting memorial yeah that's nice man yeah a memorial we can all get together again man i'll tell you this i you know it was only two years ago peter is only two years ago we were recording my cd and you were still generously uh contributed your talent and name and time and i actually went to the baked potato finally for the first time i saw jeff <laughs> lorber and jimmy and steve haas maybe and jeff richmond and i went down and we sat and uh i ate a potato those things are huge i had no idea <laughs> i always wanted to go there right mm -hmm. so um <laughs> when it goes when it gets cold here in L.A., my wife says, wear a sweater <laughs> or yes, where's exactly. your sweater? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, well, Peter, you don't, have, you don't have to stop interrupting. It's we're just kind of like a. a this a is a uh, yes, coast to coast or around the world, depending on who's talking. Yeah, Skip and I have uh, this is our third one. We decided to uh, basically do a kind of a almost weekly drum hang the day may vary and we may skip a week here and there but in these times it's nice to be able to talk with people about stuff we like to talk about it does not always drums of course um could be life could be maps i have a big map collection and skip last time <laughs> showed me this very cool yeah. map from way back of his area that is, that is great man i have one i think i mentioned it. i have one down over the phone from the Peabody Essex, that's an actual map that we oh. bought from the museum. Because every once in a while they like sell stuff or give it away. And oh. uh, my buddy from up the street here was the head designer at the Peabody Essex. He said, you got to check this out. So we got, I, maybe he even gave it to us, but it's in a frame and hangs over the, the old uh, not cell phone that's the downstairs. And uh, it's from the... Um, early 1700s it shows houses on it that's how oh that's you know. cool you know i also like globes a lot and um just on monday this week a real real great friend came over to visit and she got me two things and i don't feel able to see it but mm -hmm. uh, of course there's the hand drum and i'm not sure what it's called exactly but the box this wooden box of course yeah. there's, a, there's a globe on top I have all my, uh, oh yeah, all the stuff I didn't know what to do with is in that box. Like yes, all it's for charging cords that are laying around the house that shouldn't be. Well, now they're in there. If looks I remember like they're there, I'll go get them. <laughs> looks like <laughs> it's for playing world rhythms. Yeah, yeah, it's really uh, that beautiful gifts. Wow, I just I have so many maps now and globes. So. Um, I was going to ask you, so you, did you get to hang out at all with Roy Haynes? Uh, no, I, 
on the phone, <laughs> it, we got to go back a long way. Uh, when I first started playing jazz, I fell in love with Roy Haynes' playing. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't do anything, but I loved his playing. Mm -hmm. So um, Leonard Feather had a book called about jazz guys, right? And it had a biography of just hundreds of jazz guys, big, thick, hardbound. I think my and, mom um, that book. Yeah. And Roy's address was in there. So the enterprising young man that I was, I called information and got his phone number. <laughs> That's a good idea. So I called him up. I said, Roy, you know, I really love the playing. Uh, can you give me, can you show me how to do this? And he said, uh, yeah, I'm really busy now. This is like 1963, mm -hmm. right? This is around the time of his re trio recordings and stuff. Mm -hmm. And besides traveling, I think with maybe Sarah Vaughan or somebody like that. Uh, I said, uh, he said, where are you? And I told him I was in Cleveland. And I, he said, well, don't, don't come up here for lesson because I don't know when I have time. Well, about 48 hours later, I was on his front porch. So where was he at the time? In Roslyn, Long Island. Okay. So I jumped in my car, headed up. No heat in my car. This is in the winter. And I put a big jacket on over something like this. And there was holes in the floor. I think it was 53 Plymouth, something like that. And I drove to his house with my oh. drums in the back, right? That's great. Roy's not home. So... I go to my grandmother's house where I used to live in Westchester. Mm -hmm. And I call him a couple different times and talk to him one other time of the many times I called, but never got together with him. And then I had to drive back. <laughs> and I had borrowed money from everybody that I knew, my friends. There was a guys in another band. I told them what I was going to do. And they went, wow. And one of my friends gave me a hundred bucks, which in 63 is a lot of bread. That yeah. pretty much financed the trip. But it was that kind of thing. So every year uh, has been a, a tribute to Roy for me. And then I played for him at the Zildjian Drummers Awards. And Peter was there too. Okay. Um, and we had a big dinner at the, at the top of the Ritz Hotel for the Zildjian family and all the people, Max, Louis, Elvin. Whoa. And um, who was the last guy? Peter knows. And Terry Lynn Carrington and Peter wow. and everybody, they didn't play it. We were playing for them. Anyway, mm -hmm. at this dinner, I'm playing with the tux on, right? In the dark in the corner of this restaurant, the Ritz, yeah. Right. And we're in the dark. And Gary Burton is very magnanimous that day. So he says, we got to see the band. So he puts the lights on. And the only person that was in the spotlight was me. <laughs> And I'm like, because I've been trying to like be inconspicuous the whole time because mm -hmm. sure. who was listening? Yeah. So, but I was playing in honor for all the tunes. It was with um, the head of the bass department and the head of the bass department, head of the piano department. And uh, other guys, Zildjian guys, when they asked to do it, but they didn't want to go play for those guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I did. <laughs> I'd jump in anywhere, you know, it's like. Sure. And um and so I would been playing different ideas, some of, and did it, and did it, and did it, and did it, uh, and some of Elvin's ideas and in the course of playing music for their dining, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, Gary Burton's very magnanimous. He takes us around to each table to meet the guys. I knew all of them, but not like as friends or anything. And uh, when we met Roy again, he said, yeah, I heard him did it and did it and did it. Yeah, thank you. You know, it was like <laughs> one of those things. That's cool. And man. Louis was in real bad shape, but he was there. And he was actually the sign up guy for that book you held up. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. So I had known him from, oh, from 73 or so. This book, people. Yeah. It's a really, really nice book. This is the uh, promotional side of the. Uh, this is the promo side. Yes. Um. You know Kevin Goodman? Yeah. Kevin just made a comment. He said when I was at Zildjian, I has I have, was fortunate fortunate enough to take symbols to Roy several times at his gigs. A real gentleman, and I got to sit right next to him and really observe a master. Whoa. Yeah. Kevin, that's pretty heavy, man. He's he's one of the ones. And I'm sorry yeah. I interrupted you, but 
so Louis was there. He said Louis was in pretty rough shape, but yeah. he, and then we just went off to he was a sign off on this book. That's right for your masters, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, Louis I was out there because nobody knew. <laughs> so, yeah. So about what year was this? Which? Uh, the uh, when when the awards well, the, Trump, the awards think 90, 1998. Okay. Yes, yeah, so Louis had Parkinson's. Oh, it was Max Roach was the last guy. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I know Louis had Parkinson's. I didn't know it until after he passed away. Um, mm -hmm. I can't remember when he passed away. But I probably wasn't working with that population yet. But yeah, I got to meet him a few times. He was a real gentleman, too. Yeah, well, I told you that story about the memory thing. He remembered from, you know, 15 yes. years before that coming and seeing me play at the gig and talking to me. And it was a great lift for somebody to come in and say, yeah, I'm checking you out. Be like, whoa. I remember that. That's, yeah, that is really cool. Um, so Max Roach, you said, was that other one? We were yeah, to You're Max, to okay. Alvin, Roy Haynes, and Louis oh, Belson were the honorees. Man, imagine that. What a lineup. Yeah, it was strange. And then later on, Kenwood showed up. He was in a tuxedo with tennis shoes on, and he played. <laughs> Denard, man. It's another one. I have never seen him. Never seen him. I saw Elvin once. I saw Roy once with Miroslav and Chick. Early 80s, 82 probably in Chicago, or Evanston at Northwestern. And then, because mm -hmm. uh, I was living out there for a couple of years, and then Roy, Elvin, Max, just once at Joe Siegel's Jazz Showcase, early 80s. It was uh, Cecil, Cecil Bridgewater and Odeon Pope. And right. A, somebody Eubanks on bass, maybe Robin? I don't know. Eubanks. Yeah, I don't remember. The, the and then uh, and the, there's a guitar player, a trombone player, but I don't remember the bass player brother. When I was a kid, I might have said this before, if I did stop me, I was probably about 10 years old. My dad took me to a clinic. And uh, Louis was giving the clinic and it was at this restaurant, in a, uh, a banquet room. We were the first ones there mm -hmm. and Louis was just arriving. He was driving his, a, a car. He must have got the rental car. He brought in his own drums. We helped him, helped him set up. He told us all kinds of story about Pearl Bailey, who he was married to right. at the time. Still, she was alive. And uh, this is early 70s. And told us, told us a lot of Buddy Rich stories. <laughs> it was really funny. It was great. He was very classy, though. He would never, you know, Louis is a classy guy. And he was real nice. We got to meet him a few different times. Those are fun times for sure great you know the, the impact for me at the time as a young kid was huge meeting peter erskine when i was 11 meeting louis when i was 10 or 11 or 12 yeah huge huge presence meeting buddy rich i got to meet him a bunch of times first time i was nine mm -hmm. that night was life-changing it's like okay i'm going to be a drummer period yeah he was cool i still have his autograph many times in a scrapbook. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's that's really cool. So, you know, I was thinking, uh, you know how sometimes somebody just comes out of the woodwork with the, the, one of the most distinctive voices ever, whether it's a voice voice or musical voice. Elvin is one of those. And when I think about Elvin, I, I try to, I like, what, where did that come from? This whole approach, that sound, that feel. I mean, obviously it's him. Yeah. I, wonder, I never looked into this. Do you have any idea? Well, he had a rudimentary background and stuff like that. He knew about all that kind of stuff, but it didn't come out like what anybody else did. We talked yeah. about this before, that what people use and where they can take it is yeah. only up to them. When we talked about how, my line was Elvin Jones did the best Elvin Jones that he ever heard, as, as did yeah. Tony Williams. From getting to sit, see them play every night for a couple of weeks over a couple of years time period, it would it would sink in that they they 
in his case, I know from talking to him that he had no recourse other than to do what he could do. Yeah. It well, was because I mean, it, it makes, it, he, yeah. he liked every, everybody else. They would have other people that were inspirational. And then no matter what you did, you didn't, you couldn't really do what somebody else did the way they did it. So you get, were stuck with being who you were. Yeah. And if you really, if you really jumped on that, jumped on that train, no pun intended, you could be you. Yeah. And that, that's, we've talked about this before and it's really interesting to me when I think about Tony, I'm sorry, him too, but Elvin in particular, where that came from and how unique his voice was and still is. Um, my friend, Chris Kelly's watching. Hi, Chris. I owe you a phone call. She sang at my wedding. Oh, okay. That's 38 years ago. Wow. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> we went to college together too, up here for music. So thanks for watching, Chris. So we, uh, and then Tony said, we talked about this a little bit before. I don't always remember everything lately. It's been a little weird, but uh, that, that Tony's evolution was real interesting from the four and more days to even three or four years later. That feel and that that touch and that intensity that he built with less rebound and more single strokes. Pretty cool. And you, you yeah, got, but for me, it's like if you want to find out about the energy thing, it'd be more about checking out where he came from and like that kind of stuff. Then, yeah. yes, he did all that playing, and he would sit for all day and just play the ride, just play a cymbal and play along with records. But the other thing was, those were like the doorways that let him express the energy that he already had. So, yeah, he was like playing with like Sam Rivers in Boston, he was like sitting in a plane when he's 10 or 11 years old like like terry lynn carrington oh man her father drug him around drug her around to all his his gigs and she would sit in and play and it was just like you be you no nobody does terry like she does yeah and it wasn't like right. she didn't try to be somebody else because we all did i remember i remember at school when i was starting there she was a student so um and i heard you I don't mean to be uh, interrupting, okay. but Peter says, ask Skip to talk about the Boston lab where Tony hung out with those two drummers. The Boston uh, lab. I, yeah, I don't know about that, Peter. Are you talking about Lenny Nelson and Alan Dawson? I'll keep an eye on this. Um, I didn't know it as... The Boston Lab, but the Boston Lab and and quotes where Tony hung out with those two drummers. Is Tony from uh, Boston area? Originally from Chicago, but yes, he lived in Roxbury. Sergio okay. lived in the same building as his grand as Tony's grandmother, and has a lot of or he had a lot of old Tony Williams recordings that he left in her apartment. Oh, oh really? Yeah, it's Whoa. like a small world, you know. Wow. Peter says Lenny, yes. Lenny, yeah. yeah. Lenny Nelson. Lenny yeah. Nelson. He also taught Jeff Watts. If you talk to Jeff Watts, he's like, ah, oh, Lenny. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. I know where Jeff lives. Okay, so I have to go off on a tangent now. Because he lives right <laughs> around the corner from a, a, a real good friend of mine who I went to high school with. She's a musician. Um so when I was a kid, I was different. I just was not normal. Peter, you would remember this, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, because I used to write letters to people. The, the three people I wrote letters to were uh, Peter through the uh, Willard Alexander Agency. I think he managed maybe Kenton and Maynard. Louis Belson and Ed Shaughnessy. All three of them returned my letters. You know, back then you get a letter a month later, that's like lightning fast. You know, it's not like an email these days. So, and Peter has another comment here. I'll, I'll read that in a second. So, so then I pulled a skip and I looked up Peter's phone number when he went back to Indiana information. Remember, Peter, I would call you up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's that kid, the weirdo in Syracuse, New York. Do you remember me? Yeah, I had no, fr I had a couple of friends. I, I just, Nothing was normal about me if you, you know, normal is not actually probably a PC word to say, but I was just one of those strange kids who really was aspiring to uh, learn more 
from the people who impacted me the most. You know, Buddy, I figured he was out of reach. Peter, I figured, you know, Louis, Ed Shaughnessy, I just wanted to see if he'd respond, and he did. And he was really nice in his letter. But uh, why did I tell you that? I have no idea. COVID brain just kicked in. So Peter says, Chick Corea told me about it. Lenny would get together with this other drummer and they would challenge each other to try different wacky things. Mm -hmm. that, that sounds like fun. And thank you, be... Chris, for your comment. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of great memories from school and all the drummer gang we hung out with. We had a blast. Maybe Steve Johns was the other drummer. Another great drummer from um, Boston. Boston is one of those towns that had a lot of really good drummers. Roy, he was from there. Mm -hmm. Roxbury, his family was there. His brother was pastor of the church on Tremont Street, big church, and just passed away recently. But I mean, wow. his family was is, is still there, who we were survivors of his family. But yeah, Tony Williams was a transplant from Chicago, but I think like... A, 10 or really early right. on was it in Boston. You know, yeah. I was just looking up uh, just the other day, I was thinking about Roy Haynes. So I looked him up. He's 95 years old, that guy. Right. Yeah. And I was seeing some video from maybe even just five or six years ago. Man, yeah, I, I when I get to be like even 80, I'm like a third is agile as that guy because man i'll tell you something what an inspiration he was up here and played at the uh, shin lu performance center there's a, um, a a performance center that was built in a little town just up the road from here called rockport and the, the people in the town put 23 million dollars together and built this performance center that everybody from around the world literally comes and play it started as a classical summer thing and became like jazz program, all this other stuff. And Roy was there four or five years ago and it was burning. <laughs> he played, kept wanting to play the same tune over and over again, but he could play. And then his, his brother was with him then, I think, and came and took him off the stage because when he was playing, he was dancing. <laughs> That's beautiful, Dancing man. on stage, you know. But it, yeah, he had to be stopped. <laughs> because oh, he, man, that's, that's what he would I just love that, man. Um, so just uh, a tangent here. Rockport has the largest Parkinson's rehab center in the world, by the way. I know the owner, <laughs> Brett wow. Miller. I just interviewed him last month because he has a new app out for Parkinson's, uh, which is really kicking butt. It's a beautiful well, I, didn't, app. I didn't know that. It's like four yeah, miles it's called, from uh, It's called 110 fitness i think 110 fit, look up 110 is that the num fitness. the numeral it's uh or is it written out it's i'm sorry it's the numbers 110 fitness they they also uh just in case anyone in boston is is curious uh brent miller and his team are freaking phenomenal they work a lot with the populations i've worked with and i have a comment from kevin and chris here so i'm going to get to those in a second just so you know i see you uh, they have the largest Parkinson's rehab center in the world. And I've been around the world and I've seen a lot of them, but I haven't seen this one yet. So I want to get there. Um, if somebody is on the autism, let's say ASD spectrum, they have a fantastic program there. They also have a drumming for Parkinson's program, which, uh, you know, kind of stole my thunder because I was writing a book about that. <laughs> <laughs> so... You know what, though? I might just have to like learn some stuff and be one of their affiliates and train here. But seriously... Uh, rhythm and Parkinson's that book I showed you the neurologic handbook of music therapy talks about the extreme benefits and I see this with the people I work with whether it's autism fragile x syndrome any any all humans basically uh, if they have any kind of rhythm at all and if they don't I think I figured out a way to teach which Marcus Reuter taught me how to teach but anyways it's so beneficial and therapeutic because of the brain activity and the chemicals and the hormones and all that. So Rockport, I just wanted to mention that. So going back to uh, Kevin Goodman, Alan Dawson, Freddie, Freddie Buddha, and Lou Magnano. You know, you know, well, I, I know. Lou Magnano, I don't know about, but yeah. 
I've heard of Fred, and of course, I've definitely heard of Alan. Wish I, wish I was smart and took a lesson from that guy. I didn't do that. Yeah, he was a really nice guy too. We, we would go, his, uh, my wife and his wife and I, we, we would go see people play. I think the last time we saw was uh, Jeff Hamilton with somebody, but oh, he was God, one of those. Yeah, and we went to, he and I went to a uh, Dave Garibaldi clinic together. Mm -hmm. so he was like open mm -hmm. to like what other people were doing it was great but i never studied with him mm -hmm. i would when i would come up to boston like i told you in the 70s and do clinics and, and lessons i would go and hang out outside his door and listen to him play vibes with his students but i never got to take a lesson with him. he was gone when he left in 75 is when they asked me to go to school okay to teach there so it was like and then later on i hooked up with him outside of, of Berkeley, actually. I, I, I have yeah. a, a question that I'd like to, to as a lead in, because remember, I was kidding you that we were warm up for your thing with Peter. <laughs> for Peter, yeah. And I sent you a whole bunch of information that we would use in the class, right? Yes. So I, if you share the screen with me, I want to throw up a bad term, sorry. I want, would like to post. <laughs> uh, no, no problem here. <laughs> sorry, One second. sorry, uh, Peter. Oh, by the way, Chris Kelly, thank you for the wonderful words. I'm not going to repeat your comment because I'll be self-conscious and it's all fake news. I'm not that nice of a guy. <laughs> oh, wow. And don't wait too long for your phone call. <laughs> no, <laughs> because I owed you for about four weeks. Oh. I just honestly, like right now, you would never know that I don't feel good. I have this this thing because I keep, you know, it's just I feel good at the moment. As soon as I get up and move, I try to not live into feeling bad, but I don't feel good. I get dizzy. The second uh, time with this COVID crap, it's like, what the hell? So actually, this is kind of a therapy for me, just being able to talk with great people. And um, uh, thank you, Skip, because I enjoy our conversations a lot. Um, You're so welcome. But distracted have, is a benefit. Well, it is a benefit. It takes my mind off of some exactly. of the weird feel, especially the headaches. Oh my gosh. Um, Kevin has a comment and you should have control over the screen now. You should be able to share. My teachers at Berkeley, Lou played. Oh, okay. Those people he mentioned earlier were his teachers at Berkeley. Lou played drums and was a monster vibe player. Yeah, I don't know him at all. Was in the Don Alessi trio. Oh, I've heard of Don. Sometimes I'm ashamed because I don't know there's certain people I just don't know about that I should have known about. That just happened the other day. Oh man, who I can't remember who. Well, Chris, you live close to my daughter. You're in Radisson. She's in Radisson, but now I can't go there because I'm tested positive. So I got to wait because I don't want to get my three month old granddaughter sick or my daughter or husband. But one of these, we can at least do uh, a phone call. I actually have quite a bit of time this weekend, so I want to put it out there to the world. I'm calling Chris this weekend. Okay. Um, you can hold me accountable. Before <laughs> we, we leave, can I put this thing up? And Peter may recognize this, but the bottom of this page, if I can share it, is what I, I want you to ask Peter about. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, you should be able to share. I gave you share control. I'm not sure if Peter's still here, but Peter, ah, oh, look at that, man. That's cool. All right. Now, I don't have a date for this, but this is something that correlates. Night passage. All right. Mm -hmm. So this bottom part of this, is a, the second example is the basis of a solo piece. This is a recording I sent you to check out. It's from his initial album of his own name. Oh, and yeah. And it sounds like this sounds like it's real fast, but I'm not thinking fast. I'm not thinking one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, but rather taking a two bars at a time, each downbeat becomes one breath, two breath kind of thing. Right. By approaching in this manner, you can play a fast tempo without it sounding frantic. And this is something that Peter does like nobody else can. It can always, no matter how fast it is, it always feels like, oh, should we play this a little faster? It always has all this breath, and which is why people, I think, like to play with them because the space is there for them to create. And this correlates to a concept from 
uh, carnetic drumming where there's four different levels of time. Like in jazz stuff, like right, if you're playing right. whatever tempo the tune is starts in is the passage of the time throughout the tune. Mm-hmm. So if you're doing like a ballad and it's like da ba da da di ba di ba da 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 right da 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 those yeah, the, right, right. So the four different levels of the time. And sure. Peter's talking about being able to do this where it's a ding, chickening, 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 but he's going one, two, so that those, the original tempo of the quarter notes of the ballad. Right. Those 30 second notes are the mm-hmm. quarter notes at the top tempo. Right. And what you can do is relate to other levels rather than what you're playing. And I thought this was great. And it took me to study with Raghavan to make this stuff that happened much earlier in the reading to mm-hmm. um, make sense. So I, l- I love it. Thanks to Peter. And maybe, maybe you can explain it even yeah, more you know, you know, um, what it had to do with you. Well, you mentioned space and I'm not sure Peter's still here watching, but um I remember on one of those. I'll put it in the. I don't have the chat. I'll send it to you as a PDF, and then you can you can do it. Oh, good, good. Thanks, man. I remember one of my weird phone calls. Well, for me, it wasn't. I'm you know on his end. I don't know how he felt about it, but eight thirty had just come out. Weather report eight thirty. I had his number. I call him up. I'm talking. I I don't know. Um, I mentioned that there's a tune I can't remember because I there's a double album vinyl right and something makes me think is on the last tune on the second side or last tune. I don't know. Anyways, there's this really long pause at the end. You think the song is done, whatever song it is. I can hear it in my mind. And then boom, they hit. And it's like, gosh, that actually created so much tension in a good way or other things too depending upon how I heard it. So we we're talking about it. And he, that was the first time Peter started to explain to me so eloquently as he does uh, the value and the importance of space between notes and mm-hmm. using space. Back then I didn't quite understand. Mm-hmm. Now yeah. I understand. So I should probably practice. <laughs> you mean put it into play? Yeah. I need to, before I croak, I need to put out one CD that's just stuff that I want to do. The CD I did under my own name two years ago, I love. It was also part of a project for fundraising. So it's done fairly well, too. Peter played on that, Gary Novak, and uh, hmm, me. And um, oh, man, I can't remember the other gentleman's name. I never met him. I got to hang out with Peter and Gary, though, the studio. And Jimmy plays and Scott Kinsey and Jeff Richmond. But, yeah. Ah, Mom is watching. Hey, Mom. It looked normal, sort of, right? My shiny bald head. COVID brain. But, you know, I'm okay when I'm sitting and talking. This, like Skip and I were talking, the distraction of the discussions takes my mind off of the bags under my eyes and the headaches and all that glad you're here mom yeah mom and dad really did a lot for me in so many ways and they really you know thank thank goodness for the great music we had in our house not just records but bands (laughs) my dad would rehearse his bands there he was an arranger far more talented than i ever thought of being he did everything I just play the drums, but he wrote, he arranged. Yeah, it was really cool. Mm, that's great. Very cool. And all the food, that was good too. <laughs> so, so um, what times? I, I'm actually I'm in no hurry. I don't want to keep you longer than you have. Um, the only thing I have to do is flip the laundry. That could happen anytime later today. So I guess <laughs> I got a big job ahead of me. Um, yes, practical application. Yeah, yeah. Try to do that so that it lands in in the dryer when you're done on one. 
<laughs> Which one? Yeah. Yeah, you they're know, all that, one. That four. You know, we actually uh there was a band I was with and the guitar player we we used to have a running joke about where's one because we were listening to I, I don't know who it was. We I, I can't remember what music we were listening, to. maybe some Frank Zappa or uh, instrumental Zappa, if you will. Uh, I didn't really understand that until much later, though, afterwards, or sort of understand. There was a lot of odd time stuff. And so we played in a band and, you know, we were just doing a bunch of covers because it was more of a club and wedding band. But uh, I would always count off. Of course, everything was in four. One, 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 one. Right? Because everything's in one. We decided. Okay. Well, that would be one way to cover it. Yeah. yeah. The four layers of or four levels of time that you showed in that thing, that's there's a magic to that. Making it feel, you know, getting the feel for that. Yeah. At some point when we would do this, or it can be something I'll just send you, but there, I did a recording with um, uh, Dewey Redmond in the 90s. Oh. And uh, and Dewey and I got along. He he was really helpful to me, but we never really talked about music other than his great stories. But he didn't ever tell me what to play. It was that kind of thing. Uh, it would just show up and do your best kind of thing, and we'll we work with that. That's and cool. uh, there's a drum solo on one of the tunes that we did. It's Michael Boshin's recording, and um, and so I get the solo on this tune, and. Um, the, the, there's no hi-hat in this tune. I don't play hi-hat. So it isn't a reference to playing, um, well, I guess there is in the head of the tune hi-hat, but uh, not in the rest of the tune, or for sure not in the solo. It isn't that kind of thing. But there's time there, but you have to listen to the phrasing of the melody and know the song, as I did, and then that's in the drum solo. And so it's that's what was going on, and that, that thing was all the notes were one. Mm. So that, that's a valid concept. The name is of the, the recording. Mm -hmm. It's called Reverence. And the song was called Rat Man. And it was written for Rats O'Harris. And he was the bass player on that recording that I just found with Bill Frizzell and I and Michael Boshin. And that was from 1984. Okay, I'm just looking up Rat Man. Yeah, name of the song is Ratman. It's on uh, on YouTube. Yeah, that's where I'm looking right now. Mm -hmm. By the way, Teresa Demuzio says hi. Ah. Hello, Teresa. How are you? We haven't met yet, but she's uh, we became friends on Facebook, and uh, we know some people in common. Oh, here it is. Michael Bush yeah, should, should know Reverence. Here it is. Yeah. yeah. We should know. You should know many friends in common with Teresa. She knows everybody. Well, people can check it out and then they can hear it. I don't know. Oh, that's cool. That's nice. Glad you told me about that, Skip. Yeah, you're welcome. It was a good day. It was uh, John Coltrane's birthday when we recorded that. Oh, Nin wow. 1994, I think. Jesus yeah, I remember man. back in the 90s. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Oops, I to turn the volume down here because of the delay. Oh, it's nice of Therese to stop in. That's cool. So um, did I tell you the story about, uh, I told John to Christopher. I'll tell you a story real quick. Mm -hmm. There's a hotel. T Therese, you're going you're gonna to appreciate this. Uh, I'll do it as fast as I can. Okay, so <laughs> Cooperstown, New York. I used to play there couple times a month with two different bands there's a a big old kind of like the shining movie kind of hotel they're called the Oda Saga mm. you know it's haunted and all this other stuff so they say and uh anyways I'm I pull up I've, I've got my Wrangler with the back seat out and my little Slingerland kit there and I, I'm up in the in front pull over you know I open up I pull out some drums and these two ladies are standing on the stairs in the front of this big hotel. And one of them says, Oh, are you the drummer? I said, yeah. 
thinking, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, that's a fair question. I had drums with me. And then, uh, you know, I'm getting out more drum sets. Oh, great. Well, what kind of music do you play? So, you know, tonight would be like probably mostly jazz standards and maybe a little R&B. Just depends upon what people want. Oh, good. So I get this, the cymbal case out. They're like, well, what kind of drums do you play? Because they're all in cases. I said, well, you know, I uh, some various sets. Of, this one's a Slingerland kit, a little one. Ah, cool. And so then, the, then that, that, that those are fairly reasonable questions, except that uh, hardly anyone, unless they're a drummer, ever, ever asked me what kind of drums I play. And not to be presumptuous, I figured two ladies, why would they ask about drums? I mean, maybe they're a drummer. That's reasonable to assume, maybe. But then they say, one of them says, what kind of cymbals do you play? <laughs> OK, oh, wait a minute here. This is like, cool. Actually, so I open up the symbol case. I say, well, you know, I have a bunch of different kinds here. I'm trying some things out. I've got this beautiful Istanbul. I've got another little Istanbul. I got this beautiful Bosphorus. And look, I have some Sabians and I have, I have a, what's another one out? Peisty, I have a Peisty. I said, but you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the symbol world, but probably the most recognized name is Zildjian. I said, and this lady says, well, do you have any of those? Says, yeah, but not with me. I says, well, why? I'm like, oh boy, I have a feeling I'm in trouble. So anyways, well, I just said, you know, for this gig in this room, I just kind of like how these sound. These feel good. I don't know which ones I'm going to use. I'll just see how it feels. So then the, the other lady who hadn't said anything, she goes, like hits the one on the shoulder. She says, come on, just tell him. It was Andy Zildjian. It was Armand's wife. Like, oh my God, this is Zildjian. I'm so sorry I don't have any Zildjians with me, but she was totally cool. And then she came back and she heard us. She was actually there for a Packard show. They had like, I think it was uh, pre-World War II Packards. Beautiful vehicles. Yeah, cars. Yeah. Beautiful vehicles, right? And um, she came down and she stayed for a couple of sets, both of the ladies. And I went and... Uh, we, we talked a lot and they were talking about Lenny, Therese, your dad, Lenny DeMuzio and Armand and all these drummers and Buddy Rich and Lenny's on the turnpike. And I mean, it was really cool to talk with her. It was a fun meeting, a fun <laughs> meeting. Up. But it's so funny how it happened. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad she came back. And <laughs> to hear us. <laughs> I mean, that, that, was, that was pretty funny. So uh, anyways... That's my story of the day. Yeah, good one. So, um, but you know what I'm thinking, Skip, is maybe in just a few minutes, might go and uh, grab a little snack, get refreshed, powder my nose and my shiny head. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're getting it down. Do you have any words of wisdom for the world today? Yeah, learn piano. <laughs> I, I don't know if Peter's watching, but we were doing this. It was three years ago. I said, do you have any advice you want to give parting words? He says, yes. And the words of Steve Gadd, never pet a burning dog. <laughs> uh, I'm like, I, I think my stomach and my face hurt for about like an hour afterwards because I laughed so hard. That was a great one. Teresa, oh, yes. Teresa says, uh, great story. You never know how we are connected and I got, you know, as soon as I got my drums in there and, and, and Mrs. Zildjian was gone, I called my, remember mom, if you're watching, I called you and dad, I said, guess who I met? I told the same story. It, that was fun. So we're going to do this again, man. And uh, I'll try to be a little more organized. Uh, not that we have to be, but it's fun to talk about stories, history, to share things and uh maybe we can uh communicate before and we'll do it again and and you can learn me something <laughs> the reason i got to you just a little late this morning i was putting the url list together for that stuff that i sent you about peter oh, in cool. case you wanted to quiz him on all these things you could play him down and oh, go, what about good, this <laughs> that's a good idea
Yeah. <laughs> so, so they talk about being organizing, but wait a minute. I thought this was going to be just talking about shooting the breeze. And you'd be very specific about what you were doing in the fourth chorus of this tune. That's great. But, By the way, Kevin Goodman says, thanks, Skip. Always a pleasure listening. Yeah. Uh, nice to hear to, from you, Kevin. Say hi to John and Jackie when you see them at school. Yes. Um, Jackie's been in the room next to me for the last <laughs> 30 some years. Yeah. Oh, I was going to tell you one other thing. Did I ever tell you I went to visit Berkeley one time? No. Oh, okay. So I was doing a gig here. It was a five night a week gig. It was actually, it was really good because it got me through school and I had my own apartment. You know, I did like two years of this gig. It was also like torture a lot of times doing it, but it, it paid really well con compared to working and bagging groceries in a grocery store. And so, uh, cause I had done that as well. So then I got to play, right? So it was all good. So uh, I subbed out a Thursday night and after the gig at like literally two in the morning, I left, I drove East. I got to Boston to Berkeley at about eight 30 in the morning. I went in, I had no appointment. I just walked around. I heard drummers and I didn't have much courage back then. It was just an idea. Maybe I should go there. I listened. I listened. I walked around. I listened. I left. And I said, I'm going to stay home in Syracuse because I suck <laughs> compared to these people. <laughs> you know, and, and well, that was I, it. I mean, it was at it. one point there was 750 drummers in the program. Oh, man. So, I mean, it'd be like, you know, yeah, it would just be ridiculous. And now I think it's maybe, well, not this semester, but up till last year, it would be maybe um, 628, I think was the last number I heard. But wow, man. that's, there's a population of 4,800 students. So it's like, you know, yeah, yeah, your, your chance of hearing a few drummers would be great. Oh, I was just, you know, I, I just had to stay and then I just had to leave. So I had, yeah. it was actually a good experience. Um, it wasn't a bad experience. It just was a learning experience. So before we sign off, I just want to let people know <laughs> this book is a great book. And, uh, I, you know, one of the things that, that captures me here is the beat, the body, and the brain. I just love how it's put together. There's some really good, um, there's a CD in it too, of course. Yeah, and the and the, the players in that it were friends of mine at the time. It was really good. Giovanni Hidalgo, uh, Alan yeah. Malay, Oscar uh -huh. Stagnaro, um, Alberto Neto is on there, and oh, there's a a drummer from Peru. It was a student okay. of mine, really good guy. I don't know what happened to him. And um, Victor Mendoza is playing vibes. Yeah, right. And they, they were That's they were great. willing to do that thing for free. I ended up, Sandy Felstein produced it for me, and we ended up being able to pay them. But everybody signed on. The graciousness of those guys was amazing. And my uh, youngest son was the gopher. He kept going around seeing if anybody wanted anything in the <laughs> studio. Yeah, it was a family thing. Who did the cover art? I don't know. That would be um, somebody. Oh, could be Alfred Music. Yeah, because that's not the original cover. That's the right. second edition of it. Mm -hmm. The other one was one that I made up that Sandy bought for a oh, CPP Bell one, which got sold to Warner Brothers, which got sold to. So it's been around for, what, 30 years now. That was 1991. Yeah. Yeah. So it's maybe really nobody wants to buy it because it's old information. But the information in the process is really good. Oh, it's but it's timeless too. So when I look at it, just reading through the list of players and tunes, that's history. I look at it as okay, here's a resource, but it's also some history. There's some things I out there I had no clue about, and now I do. Oh, and then good. the way it's written, both the words and everything else is succinct and easy to understand for a guy like me who I don't read well. I can write better than I can read. Um, it's just it's an easy read for me. Then, of course, the playing the notes is probably not an easy practice after seven years of not playing, but it'll come back. Yeah. All well, right, my friend. Okay, at some point, uh, we'll 
get together again. And I hope that you feel better. Thank you. I really appreciate you doing this today because, you know, honestly, it does take my mind off of this, which actually makes me wonder how much of this is psychological. But the test came back positive again. I had three negative COVID tests in a row after having COVID, and then it comes back positive. So is it a false positive? We don't know yet, but I expect to hear from my doctor because he's really good about calling. And uh, the question would be, what was the difference of how you felt when it was negative as opposed to when it was said it was positive? I I haven't really felt good since December 17th. I've had days, though, this is the days of the first symptoms. So if anyone, you know, not to go off too much, but I think it's really important because we are in a a time period that's unprecedented in many ways. We have a pandemic. We have a virus that is doing things we didn't know it could do, and we don't know what it can do still because it hasn't been here long enough for us to get the data and the research and really have the knowledge. So there's, it's still very, very new. My son is a, I'm bragging totally, MD, PhD. He's an emergency room physician in Atlanta, Emory, the busiest trauma center, I think, in the country. Mm-hmm. He sees it. His wife is a, a nurse practitioner, same, uh, I think it's the same company, different hospital down the road, but they're seeing this every day. There's the way it's affecting people. It's still too early to tell, but we know some stuff. We know that there can be long hauler effects. I'm considered a long hauler. That means that when I started to feel better, maybe three, four weeks ago, it would come and go. I never really got feeling super energetic. I exercised once for about 20 minutes and that was it. I was exhausted. Things are different and my memory is different. Sense of smell is completely gone at this moment. I'm not worried, but I also don't want to be irresponsible and neglectful. And especially if you have underlying conditions, I have respiratory issues, a history and blood clotting, uh, Mm. genetic hereditary blood clotting. And uh, this virus is known to cause clots. Wow. Now, I manage mine through Coumadin, and you know, which a lot of people do, or some kind of type of blood thinner minus Coumadin, but it doesn't guarantee that I won't get a clot. I uh, mean, I could go on and on, but I won't. But doing this it is beautiful. I the conversations are great. It's really nice. It's an honor to know you, to get to know you, and and learn from you and your stories, and just to be able to communicate and it definitely takes my mind off of this headache that's going on that doesn't go away no matter what so you know what there are people way worse off than me i just don't want to go out and infect anyone so i'm staying home yeah, yeah. So, they uh, thank you for that yeah oh oh you just sent me that okay i that yep i got that email well good well thank you so much my friend thanks everyone Therese, kevin chris peter And anyone who I didn't uh, mention, I'm sorry, but thanks for watching. Take care, everyone. Yeah, mom. mom. Oh, my God. The most important person. Mom. I I think she was part of everyone we've done now. Yeah. I think so. (laughs) And uh, Skip, as always, thank you, my friend. Yeah. Thank you. It's great hanging out with you. You too. All right. I'll be in touch soon and we'll do something again soon. All right. All right, buddy. Take care, everyone. Take care, Skip. You too. All right. Bye-bye.